Hey, Mushroom Nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I wanted to uh, film a quick correction and clarification of a video that I made yesterday. Uh, so I shared this uh, absolutely gorgeous specimen of a uh, violet coral mushroom, and I misidentified it. So this is Clavaria, let's hold him steady, Clavaria zolingeri. And uh, they look like little antlers, and they're kind of this beautiful purpley color. I called it uh, Romeriopsis pulchella. Um, um, and I uh, am really glad that I got a correction from some folks who were very kind to uh, point me in the right direction. So I want to also clarify, I'm not a coral mushroom expert, never would claim to be so. Um, not that anyone accused me of that because uh, coral mushrooms are very, very difficult. But I uh, now being out on a Sunday morning, learning in the woods, uh, I have happened to cross something that might be a uh, clavulina uh, coralloides. So another Another kind of coral mushroom that's a little bit on the uh, brittle and robust side and has these really pointy tips. And then I also have this sort of like drab, you know, lilac brown character, and I don't know exactly what it is. So I'm playing around with my coral mushrooms. We'll see how far my curiosity carries me. Uh, I also wanted to talk really quickly about um, one of the things that I mentioned about Lactarius indigo groups. So this is a beautiful uh, blue colored mushroom. It has, uh, you know, this abundant blue latex or juice that uh, bleeds from the uh, gills. And so it's a really just, you know, ravishing and dramatic mushroom. And I mentioned also that one of the key identification features is uh, a zonate cap. So you have these concentric growth zones. And I mentioned uh, and explained that there is another genus of milky mushrooms, Lactifluus, and they do not have zoned caps. I wanted to make sure it was clear that that doesn't mean that all non-zoned milky mushrooms are in the Lactifluus genus. So basically, uh, my understanding is that Lactifluus is a genus that was split off from Lactarius. So, uh, and Lactarius has a lot of different mushrooms in it, including many that have zones. And uh, the Lactifluus genus are all mushroom species that don't have zones. So anyway, that's uh, what I meant by that. I also um, wanted to make sure that I was able to share uh, these particular mushrooms bleeding a little bit more abundantly uh, than the mushroom I found yesterday. And then finally, I wanted to uh, just really briefly, let's see where we are. Here we are. Okay, so I also wanted to make sure that I used the singular word for these beautiful little pits that you find on the stem of Lactarius indigo mushrooms. So you have this like zoned blue purple blue bleeding mushroom and oftentimes you have these little uh, pits and that is called a scrobiculus. I don't think I used the singular. I just said sp scrobiculi. So anyway, I am starting to um, try to incorporate, you know, saying that various things are a pain in the scrobiculus if, uh, if if they, uh, you know, bother me. And so anyway, I just wanted to clear those things up. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your mushroom season and uh, find lots and lots of things. Hey, mushroom nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I am out in one of my very favorite mushroom patches uh, in early August and have found just all kinds of amazing things. So I am going to start uh, with this character here to my left uh, growing on this log. This is Artemisis pixidatus. The crown tip coral mushroom, I was starting to uh, throw him all over the place. Uh, but this is a delightful edible mushroom, pretty easy to identify, so I'll cover the features for that. I also have black trumpet mushrooms, Craterellus phallax. I have blue bleeding Lactarius indigo group. I've got a grip of chanterelles. I have a hedgehog mushroom thrown in for good measure, a couple of other fun things. But uh, let's start with this Artemisis pixidatus. So um, common name here is the crown tip coral mushroom. It does exclusively grow on wood and that's an important feature for identification. So you have numerous mushrooms that have kind of, um, you know, coral-esque features. And Artemisis pixidatus is one of the very, very few of them that grow on wood. So you have this genus called Romeria, and it's these big, uh, well, not always big, but, you know, oftentimes quite large uh, fleshy mushrooms. And uh, they bear resemblance to Artemisis pixidatus. Now, many, many people eat Romeria. They're really difficult to identify to species. Some of them have a laxative effect. So if you're not interested in uh, seeing if you're sensitive to it, um, you know, maybe just stick with uh, this particular species. 
species if you want to try corals. Anyway, so you have a sort of a tall and slender fruiting body growing on wood. The thing also that makes the crown tip coral mushroom distinctive is uh, it's the tips of its fruiting bodies. And you can see it's got these sort of like clever little crenellations. So you got three to four little tips. And it basically means that the, you know, the top of the mushroom has sort of a flush surface with these little prongs here. Now that's an important thing to note. I have a beautiful little fella here. This is uh, Romeriopsis pulchera. Uh, and this is uh, the very, uh, pulchella. Oh gosh, pulchella. Sorry, I'm trying to encode this. I'm trying to remember this mushroom because it sounds like Coachella, except it's a Pulchella because you pull a coach. I don't know if that's going to work at all, but I'm, I'm working on it. Obviously, my first attempt to deploy this mnemonic device uh, failed. But anyway, Romeriopsis Pulchella is uh, known as the um, violet coral mushroom. And as you can see, it has tips too, but they're not as even. And so they're like little, little fingery branches, but they aren't these uh, really distinctive sort of, um, you know, little crowns that you can see at the uh, top of your Artemisia pixidatus. So, um, you know, you want to just be aware that there are a lot of other sort of coral looking mushrooms, but if you have these uh, crown tips growing on wood and also this sort of uh, tall, slender and whitish fruiting body, uh, that's what you're looking at. And uh, Artemisia pixidatus, oftentimes you'll see toward the bottom of the fruiting body, it gets a little more like brown or even a little bit like reddish brown right down here. Uh, but, you know, it's sort of um, a beige to creamy color uh, on the top when it's in its good condition. Additionally, the fruiting body is kind of resistant and resilient. Uh, one of the reasons this is a fun mushroom to, to cook with is that it is uh, not rubbery, but, you know, it has a little bit more uh, robustness to its fruiting body than a lot of mushrooms that have a lot more uh, moisture content in them. So this is a great mushroom to get to know. I uh, personally appreciate it a good little bit, especially because it, uh, you know, roasts up into these nice little mushroom crisps, and I'm a, I'm a fan of that. All right, so let us proceed to talk about uh, Craterellus phallax here. So black trumpet mushrooms, this is one of the, uh, you know, sort of the, the um, gray black grail of the North Carolina Piedmont mushroom hunting scene. As you can see, this is a fairly diminutive mushroom. It's really uh, quite delicious. It has a, you know, nice, robust, earthy flavor. It also, uh, you know, can flavor things far greater in proportion to its volume. And so, you know, you don't need a tremendous number of black trumpets to make a fairly big difference in a dish, but they are kind of like nice and chewy and earthy and they're just fun. Uh, but for me, it's also a matter of like how uh, fun it is to find them because as you can see, black trumpets are just sort of this little uh, gray, blackish, brownish, a little bit uh, sort of tan pink on the inside. And they look like a little hole or um, more often, let's see if I can find here we go. So I am in a, uh, a grove that is predominantly white oak. And what I've got all over the forest floor looks like this. And as you can see, our black trumpet, Craterallis phallax, is sort of like grayish with a little bit, you know, uh, sort of underlying black and then this dark curly uh, sort of black brown thing going on, a white oak leaf. I mean, it, you can't get much closer and, and they grow up in and around <laughs> these oak leaves. So, um, you know, I've been to this mushroom patch, I can't even count the number of times over the years, and I don't think I've ever seen black trumpets here. And that is not to say that they don't reside here regularly, but I think this is a real testament to how, uh, you know, fun it can be to find a mushroom that's really, really difficult to, uh, to track down. And, uh, you know, to that point, I, I have, gosh, here, let me, let me show you the full sort of handful I have here. For gloating purposes so I'm gonna just scoop these little fellows up so basically what I've got here is you know a number of these uh, fruiting bodies that are really sort of uh, frail and thin they don't have any gills underneath uh, craterellus uh, the genus that this belongs to are typified by having big craters or holes in the top so that makes uh, the you know the genus name fairly memorable 
And uh, it, when that this one is probably the one that's in the most sort of iconic condition. So it's like got this slightly uh, pinkish spore uh, deposit that it is uh, going to be pumping out or is currently. So you can see a little sort of like pinky tone to this gray uh, outer surface and then, you know, much, much darker and sometimes almost like a little bit scaly on the inside. Um, they have a nice aroma. It's a little bit fruity and a little bit, uh, you know, earthy, cheesy. You do want to be aware that these mushrooms, when they spoil, they can still smell cheesy, but not in a good way. So you want to make sure you are collecting uh, fresh specimens. But uh, as far as preparation is concerned, you know, you can fry them up. I like to, uh, you know, wash them off pretty thoroughly. And then I will prepare them actually oftentimes to the side of some other dish and I add them just because they're not super abundant. But also, you know, when you soak them in water, oftentimes that water gets a lot of black trumpety flavor to it. So you can use that water to flavor things. And it's, it's a really fun mushroom to find and a really fun mushroom to cook with and experiment with. Because despite the fact that they're really appear to be very frail, they're actually quite forgiving when you cook them, especially when you compare them with some of our other mushrooms. And, uh, you know, to that point, I'm going to talk about chanterelles. Uh, and my my preferred uh, methods for picking and collecting them. So this is the bag of chanterelles that I'm going to bring home. I'm going to make a lot of these into chanterelle bacon. Um, I have determined over the course of years that, uh, first of all, there are only so many chanterelle mushrooms that I want to eat in a given week. I don't like to put them up and store them in great, you know, numbers. Like a lot of people do, uh, you know, parboil and freeze them um, and similar. For me, I'm like, okay, I am going to collect literally what will fit inside of this hat. And uh, let's see, I feel like I have a bug on me. Nope, I don't. Okay, that's awesome. So, you know, I collect the contents of what I can fit into this hat. And that is, uh, you know, more than enough for me to do uh, a variety of things. And so this is, you know, this is a pretty big haul for me. I have definitely not collected this many chanterelles in a while. But the reason I've done this is because I uh, have discovered that I really, really enjoy chanterelle bacon. And so uh, I will give you very briefly the instructions for that if you're interested. This works also with a lot of other mushrooms. I had actually never tried it with chanterelles and uh, originally uh, king trumpet uh, oyster mushrooms were the mushrooms I used for this, uh, this bacon recipe. So anyway, what you wanna do is you take your chanterelles and you get them nice and clean. And that's another thing about my collecting habits. I'm like, I don't get a tremendous number. I get a nice healthy amount, but I make sure that they're really, really clean before I put them in my bag. And to that end, I have my mushroom nunchucks. So first of all, I really like a good brush. And this is actually a car detailing brush and uh, it is nice and firm. It's easy to get clean as well, which is nice. I can just kind of brush it off with a little bit of uh, rubbing alcohol and that's awesome. Then I have it tied to my mushroom hunting knife. The reason for this is, uh, you know, I've had a variety of mushroom knives over the years that are like a knife with a clever little brush on the end and that's awesome. But um, this brush is really great and this is a lot harder for me to lose. Uh, additionally, you know, if I ever walk in the woods alone, I'm like, I've got my mushroom hunting nunchucks back off. I know what I'm doing. Um, so anyway, <laughs> what I was getting to with that uh, is that I get them really, really clean and I only take a, a small number. And so anyway, what you do to make the bacon is you uh, wash your chanterelles. Don't be afraid of washing chanterelles. That's my opinion. Then I parboil them for a couple of minutes, not long, so like up to three or four minutes or so. And then I let them dry really, really thoroughly. And all you have to do at that point is to salt and oil them and um, roast them at 350 for about 40 minutes. And you wanna flip them over about 20 minutes in. And then you put a little bit of maple uh, syrup, a little bit of, uh, you know, if you're feeling frisky, like I often am, a little bit of um, uh, liquid smoke. And then I had some uh, chili powder and some black pepper, just a couple of spices. Anyway, 
they crisp up and they really do take on a good, um, you know, quasi bacony flavor. And I was surprised that the chanterelle flavor actually remains throughout that entire process of like salting and boiling and cooking and tossing with <laughs> maple syrup, which is very strongly flavored, but it does have a very nice, uh, you know, crisp to it. So uh, I'm going to do a good bit of bacon with, with these. And I also, um, well, I'm sure I'm going to make a pizza or two, maybe, um, maybe do some risotto. We'll see. Uh, so anyway, you know, I, I'm not denigrating the practice of collecting a lot of mushrooms by any means, but for my personal purposes, I try to collect the mushrooms I know I'm going to eat, that I know I'm going to want to eat. So the ones that are very, very clean and uh, that I'm going to want to hike around for the rest of the day with. And so I'm going to spend time with these chanterelles and then they will go home with me and be consumed with much delight and uh, to do. All right, let's talk about Lactarius indigo group. So this is a species group to my understanding. No one has, um, I guess, delineated between how many different uh, species of this we have, but uh, it is a very, very distinctive type of mushroom. It is edible. Um, and I was recently given some advice about how to actually roast it uh, so that it's a little more um, pleasing than it's meant to me. So, you know, in the past, uh, I have found this mushroom to be a little bit on the mealy side and uh, not like super distinctive in its flavor enough to make it worth the effort of working with a brittle sort of mealy mushroom. However, I'm gonna take this home and I'm gonna try because Lactarius indigo group is just such a striking mushroom. I can't get enough of it. All right, so let's talk about identification. First of all, as you can tell, this is a blue mushroom. There are lots of blue mushrooms and purple mushrooms, but nonetheless, Lactarius indigo group is probably the bluest of the blue mushrooms, I would say. Uh, not only do you have like these dark, dark blue gills, you have a nice, pleasing, uh, concentric growth zoned uh, cap that oftentimes at maturity has this big divot in the middle. That's sort of a like silvery blue, really, really pretty. This one is a little bit, uh, you know, sticky uh, on top. Sometimes as these mature also, they take on a little bit of like green staining. And so, you know, you can see a little bit of sort of yellowish discoloration here. I'm not entirely sure if that was a a leaf or, uh, you know, something different, but you'll definitely see these mushrooms, uh, actually, oh, I've got, uh, an example of what I'm talking about with the green here. So here's a, a different specimen and it's starting to have this, uh, like slightly, you know, more aquamarine color than straight up like blue. All right. So you have concentric growth zones. You have these dark blue gills. Another thing that you have and this is a new word that I learned, are these uh, pits that are on the stem. And these are called scrobiculi. <laughs> Um, and, uh, which just basically in anatomy means a pit or a depression. But anyway, I, uh, oftentimes will see these on the stems of Lactarius indigo group. If you look at them under a hand lens, they're kind of, uh, full of like this greasy gooey material. It's really, really cool. But also for photography, you have this sort of like pits of deeper, uh, color here. That's really, uh, quite striking. All right, the reason that Lactarius indigo group belongs in the Lactarius genus, or, or well, the easiest way to tell that it's a member of the Lactarius genus, if I could open my knife, I will show you. All right, so Lactarius indigo group, uh, like other Lactarius mushrooms, has what's called a, uh, a latex. So it's basically a juice that uh, bleeds from the gills. Oh, this one's not very abundant, but let's see what we can do if we actually just cut it. Oh, there we go. Okay, so what you can see here is a lot of blue, really, really dark blue juice. So it's the color of these gills, except, you know, as it starts to uh, disperse, it's even darker. Uh, in some specimens, this is like way, way more abundant than this particular one. But it is also one of the most fun things about finding this mushroom because, you know, it's blue on its outside. It has these scrobiculi, which are delightful, and then it gets blue juice all over your stuff. And, uh, you know, despite the fact that that's a little messy, it's also like insanely fun and just appeals to the, you know, inner um, finger painter in me, I suppose. 
So that is Lactarius indigo group. Here's another specimen. Let's see if we have any more juice coming out of this, this one here. Oh yeah, this one's a little bit more abundant. So you can see, I mean, it's just basically, you know, when, you, when you're when you done uh, handling this mushroom, it often looks like you've been manhandling a Smurf. Like there's just a lot of material that comes off of it. So uh, another thing I do want to actually highlight about this mushroom is the concentric growth zones on the cap. So you can see it's really neat and and, uh, and really quite pretty uh, different zones here. And that is a feature that helps uh, distinguish between Lactarius, uh, this genus, and then Lactifluus, which is this genus. So this is another milky mushroom called Lactifluus volimus. And as you can see, it doesn't really, I mean, it, it has different zones insofar as the color is darker in the middle, uh, but it does not have this very clear like concentric zonation going on. And so uh, if you have a mushroom that has these zones, you're looking at a lactarius mushroom. If you have one without, that uh, can be a lactifluous mushroom. And lactifluous volimus is uh, commonly called the fish milky cap. It is a popular edible. So this is a mushroom that you really do have to cook thoroughly. Um, and, uh, you know, it, but however, it is, it's tasty. It's got a nice sort of, um, you know, bite to it as well. So let's cover the identification features for this one. So first of all, it is called Lactifluus volimus in part because it has very voluminous latex. So I was struggling to get much milk out of uh, my Lactarius indigo group, but as you can see, Lactifluus volimus is just like not bashful whatsoever. It is very voluminous like latex and it is very sticky. Uh, it is kind of hard to get off of your hands and it does not smell good. So it's very latexy in its aroma. Like some mushroom, it's called, some mushrooms have latex, but it doesn't smell like anything. This really does smell bad. Um, over time, what will happen is that that uh, latex will actually stain this dark brownish color. And so that's a, an identification feature to look out for is you have a, a mushroom that's sort of a terracotta color. You oftentimes have also sort of a, you know, a uh, slightly lighter color on the stem, but it is an orangey color and it's like smooth, but occasionally fluted. So it's really nice and, uh, you know, firm. Uh, and then uh, this voluminous juice that will over just a couple of minutes stay in this dark, dark brown. Uh, it smells quite strongly of fish and latex. It is definitely a mushroom that like when it's in your basket, it does not appear to be very appealing. But when you get it home and cook it and cook it thoroughly, it can become a very, very uh, tasty mushroom and certainly one that is worth getting to know. So again, Lactifluus volimus is uh, one to look out for. Oh, another thing that I will mention is that this cap, um, you know, in addition to being this sort of nice terracotta color, it also has this nice, like almost uh, like newt skin, like rubbing a newt's belly is what I like to imagine I'm doing when I handle this mushroom. So it's a little bit on the roughened side and is the same color as a newt. So it's, it's uh, reminiscent of a thing that I wish I could do more frequently, but uh, to the much to the delight, I'm sure of the world's newt population, I have a good substitute in the form of Lactifluus volimus. All right, so I think, let's see, have we covered everybody? I think we actually have covered everybody. Um, I think the main thing that I wanna leave you with is that, you know, mushroom hunting in the summertime is such a wonderful experience because there is so much abundance. And, you know, I'm in a chanterelle patch where there is no way that I could pick all of the chanterelles that are growing here today and have an opportunity to find, you know, for instance, this uh, adorable little Romeriopsis uh, pulchella um, because, you know, it's, it's just so dainty. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about mushroom hunting is, you know, once you see these black trumpets, that makes you slow down. When I say you, I mean me, cause I was storming around and, you know, very excited about my different, uh, milky cat mushrooms and saw myself one black trumpet growing on top of some leaves. And all of a sudden I, I unearthed this gorgeous little thing, which to be perfectly honest, this is a mushroom that's been on my bucket list for a long time, and it is, I would say, my biggest prize of today, because I will remember it always, even if I don't happen to remember its scientific name for a couple more tries. I hope you have a great rest of your mushroom season and that you're doing well. Take care.